have always hated the cold. I mean hated, and lucky for me, I grew up in it. I got to suffer for year after year. And to add to the delight, I had quite the non-traditional childhood. You see, my mother and father were into making moves. They knew a lot about change. And lucky for me, my mother enrolled me in the concept of positivity. You see, she sat me down at a very young age where, believe it or not, back then, I was painfully shy. <laughs> and she said, oh, Meredith, dear Meredith, you've got to work on that a bit. Because you see, kids here, they're going to stay in the same old house and they'll probably go to the same old school and they'll live in the same old town growing up. But you, my dear, get to have friends all over the world. But... I didn't only embrace it. I went all in. Everywhere I went, I started saying, Hi, I'm Meredith. Nice to meet you. And it worked. In fact, I found myself being a love bug. And to this day, everywhere I go, I love to greet a room and make as many friends as possible. However, my non-traditional route of moving and moving and moving had some funny parts. Like when I would go to friends' houses and I would say, what does your mom do for work? Because my parents were workers and movers. And one time my friend said, my mom doesn't work. And I said, what do you mean? What does she do all day? <laughs> it was very confusing being me growing up, but I wouldn't change a thing for the world. Except when I finally got to high school, get this, this is the truth. I had attended 14 different schools. So when mom and dad said I got to stay in the same place for high school, I was thrilled. I mean, beyond measure. And I'll never forget, I feel like it was yesterday, walking into assembly to see my first professional public speaker who said something that literally changed the course and trajectory of my life for forever. He put his finger up and started waving at all of us and said, did you know, kiddos, listen up, less than 1% of the world sets goals. So if you simply set goals, you'll be 99% ahead of the rest of the world. So guess what I got to be? A goal slayer. Goal number one, get out of the cold. <laughs> I was going to move, I had a very clear vision, to California. And I was going to have a view of the ocean and mountains far, far away from frigid Philadelphia. The only trouble was I hit another bump in the road. You see, my senior year in high school, mom and dad sat me down again and said, bad news, it was a bad year and we don't have any savings for college. Devastated, I sat on it for a moment and I became a goal-slaying college applier, a professional college applier and for colleges that had scholarship and anybody who would talk to me about scholarship. And as luck would have it, it was actually a miracle. I did not get one scholarship. I did not get two. I got three. One came directly from my high school and I literally cried from appreciation. The second one came from CBS News. You see, at a very young age, I fell in love with the art of storytelling. And I knew that I was on track to retire Barbara Walters or Oprah Winfrey, whichever came first, if I could just get to college. So as luck would have it in my destiny, the third scholarship came from my school in New York, TV market number one, and off I went. And as luck would have it, I worked for every major network in the United States, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, CNN. I worked for Barbara Walters, Barbara Walters The View, Barbara Walters Specials, and there was actually one network I didn't work for, the WB, but it was okay that I didn't work for the WB because my goal was just to tell good stories. And then it hit me. I hadn't made it to California yet. In fact, I had another goal that popped up in my mind that I hadn't fulfilled. I decided I wanted to do something nice and go back to my high school. But if I went back to my high school to talk and inspire students, 
I hadn't made it to California yet. So I went away with my girlfriends for the weekend, like all goal slayers do. And we went around the room and talked about the dreams and goals that we hadn't fulfilled yet. Of course, I brought up the California thing. It was always my thing. And I had a girlfriend who said, wait a minute. My friend Cynthia said, I just bought an investment property in Los Angeles and it's gonna be ready in two weeks. Everybody turned to me and they're like, you get to go to LA. I was totally enrolled. And I went home and I told mom and dad and mom and dad were like, you're not going to LA. You are not even considering leaving your family. And do you know about the fires, the earthquakes, how expensive it is? And that's all true, by the way. <laughs> However, mom said, you can't go. So with my head down, in sheer utter disappointment, I thought timing is everything. Maybe mom and dad aren't right. And I slept on it and I woke up in the morning and it hit me like a lightning bolt. It doesn't matter what mom and dad think. It was my dream, my goal and my life. And I was headed to LA. And two weeks later, rest assured, I showed up and guess what happened? Everything. I literally, I got hired to work speaking all over the world in one year. In that first year, I got to lift the spirits of people and motivate the masses over and over again. And it wasn't really my goal, but wow, I made more money that year than I'd ever made in my life in the most expensive city. Yes, mom, you were right. But here's the deal. I went to an event. I was thrilled with what was happening and I decided, okay, I could go back to my high school and speak, except I didn't know anybody there anymore. And so I reached out literally 17 times. Listen, I want to donate a speech. I want to inspire people. I want to give back. And it went unanswered until I got an email. And I received an email that the principal would finally talk to me, except they didn't have a budget. I'm like, wait a minute, this is a donation. I don't need a budget. I said, no problem, I'll pay to fly from California. So she said, you're coming in from California? Oh, goodness gracious. Do you know how big we are now? I said, excuse me? She said, we have stadium seating and we're gonna fill it twice. We'll need to do two assemblies. I said, I don't care, I am in. And guess what happened? When I arrived, it was snowing. I was like, goodness gracious. <laughs> anyway, it was a privilege to be there. Cold or not, I was in my dream and I was making it happen for the kids. I was letting them know it is possible, no matter what, to go for your dream and run it down. And here's what happened. At the end of the first assembly, the kids started lining up. I started to cry. What were they lining up for? They wanted to tell me their goals and dreams. Mm. And then at the second assembly, it happened all over again. But at the end, the adults were waiting. And in that line were two people from the largest credit card company in the United States who had seen a press release that I was coming back. And they said, we would love to hire you to come back to your hometown and talk to our leadership team. Unbelievable things happen when you follow your heart just to be generous and run down a dream. But the best part was when I went back home and the emails kept running in from the students. They said, Meredith, could you help me tell my mom about my dream? Meredith, I didn't know I could live my dream. Could you maybe hop on the phone with me? It was very humbling, but it still gets better because I was so inspired I decided it's not enough to just go back. You've got to give back. So I decided to set up a scholarship fund and I shared it with a few friends that I went to school with in high school and they decided to donate. And then before I knew it, the money started to fly in. We were able to create a very nice scholarship fund. So I went home and I recognized that things might not get any better. And boy, was I right, because I got a phone call from my mother. It's, you know, the call you never want to get. She said, come quickly. Daddy has collapsed. I'm like, what? I just talked to him yesterday. So I hopped on a plane and a few hours later, I'm staring at my mom 
and my dad who was green in the hospital. It turns out I felt like I was underwater because what they were saying didn't make sense. My sweet father, my best friend on earth, was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Now, if you don't know the deal on pancreatic cancer, here's the 411. It has a less than 1% survival rate at best. So I did what any goal slayer would do. I phoned friend after friend after friend, and for 48 hours straight, I was certain I was gonna get my dad into the best hospital in Los Angeles, and mom and dad were gonna move in to my house, and I was gonna be able to take care of everything, except my dad, in those 48 hours, had gone to see his doctor. And the way my mother tells the story, that jerk doctor looked into my father's eyes and said, listen, People are gonna tell you you can take chemo and do experimental things, but no matter what, in 90 days, you'll be dead. What a jerk. Like, if I ever met this doctor, I could have strangled him. I would. So, my father informed me that he would not be coming to my house to die. He was gonna die at home in peace where he wanted to be for his last days, comfortable. <laughs> That was a lesson that I learned that was very, very hard. You see, you have to be careful what you commit to, whether it's a goal or a dream or to die. Unfortunately, my dad liked defying the odds. So he did not die on the 90th day. His FU to cancer was on day 91. Unbelievably broken and numb I went back to California and this time I took my mother with me. I decided if she was gonna grieve, she didn't have to be alone. And I chickened out a little bit. I freaked out to be honest and I took a job because I thought if I'm gonna be in the most expensive place in the world, I better take great care of my mama. But just one month after I got back to California, the rug got pulled out from under me again and I lost my job with no notice. Lucky for me, I was in a leadership program, so I had somebody to phone with the great news, called my coach, and I said, guess what? Code red. Mom and I might be homeless in, I don't know, three weeks. <laughs> you have anything for me? And she said, are you sitting down? And I said, yes. She said, I need you to stand up. Okay. And put your arms up in the air, which I did. And she said, repeat after me, this is awesome. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> She's like, put your arms up in the air. I'm like, how did she know I put them down so fast? And she said, repeat after me, this is awesome because you hated that job. This is awesome. And I'm like, it is not awesome. And she's like, Meredith, put your arms up again. You're free and you hated that job. And the weirdest thing happened, I laughed. I hadn't laughed since I lost my dad. And you know what? She was 100% correct. Because here's what happened. With my head down, I started phoning friends and I got hired again to speak all over the world. And that credit card company that wanted to hire me to fly back couldn't do it anymore because the world was changing and shut down. So instead they said, we have an even bigger ask. Do you think you could talk about change to our entire leadership team across the United States of America via Zoom? Yes, I can, I said. And then it happened again and again and again. And another weird thing happened. I started getting hired to mentor business owners, entrepreneurs, and corporate people to navigate through change and here's the deal, whether my clients were in Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Greece, or right here at home in the United States, they all had a collective grief. And I knew grief, so I was literally the perfect mentor for them. Well, except for the fact that I hadn't gotten my view. So I decided to look at 27 different places, 27, but on the 28th, wow. I saw it. It was a panoramic view that I could not even believe was so gorgeous. There were yachts off in the distance, 
The sailboats were sailing, the paddle boards were paddling, the sea lions were making their noises. And I had my dog with me and I looked down at her and I said, Biscuit, we have made it. <laughs> the only trouble was Biscuit and I walked from room to room and I had a moment with her. We have deep talks. And I said, Biscuit, something doesn't feel right. You know, my dad, was rough around the edges. He cursed like a sailor. He was so grouchy at times we called my dad, whose real name is Oscar. No, just kidding. Whose real name is Alan Oscar. He was so grouchy, but underneath it all, he was a total love bug. He gave the best hugs. And I realized that after I lost my dad, I had become kind of frozen around the heart, like hardened, and I didn't like it. So no matter what goal I was slaying, I realized I hadn't dropped into my heart and it didn't feel right. So I looked at Biscuit and I said, enough is enough, we get to share this. And suddenly, a gentleman who's here in the middle of the room showed up in my life just like that, like magic. So I'm gonna ask every single one of you to stand up right now, and if you're watching on Amazon Prime and you're on the toilet, wipe your tush and stand up. <laughs> stand up right now because I want you to feel change. And if you wanna feel change, you've gotta understand that you've gotta make moves. You might have to make moves that you don't see coming. You might have to make moves that you don't wanna make, but you make them anyway. So if you're gonna change, raise your arms up in the air, raise them up high, and repeat after me. You get to make moves. You get, you get to, to make moves. moves. Okay, hands down. And stay standing. You make moves, but you gotta keep on going. And sometimes things are gonna come up. You are going to have things throw you completely off track, but you get to embrace change. Repeat after me and raise your arms. You get to embrace change. You get to embrace change. Yes, you do. Okay, arms down. Now, you get to embrace change, but sometimes you get to run down a dream. Not everything's gonna go right. And you've got to recognize that sometimes you get to be the change. So repeat after me, raise your arms. You get to be the change. Thank you. And when you are being the change, it will all come together and you can create magic. Repeat after me, magic. Thank you and have a seat. Now, one last unbelievable share that I get to give you. Two days before I boarded my plane to be here with you, I got an email. This time, I didn't even know they were meeting. I got an email from the scholarship committee at my high school. It turns out that they were awarding a scholarship for the second year that my classmates and I created. But this year, it went to a young lady who just lost her father. He was only 40 to coronavirus. And she had to move unexpectedly. But here's the good news. She gets to go to college anyway. So here's the deal. Change is gonna come over and over. But I invite you when it does to be the light, to be generous, to be a love bug. Because I promise you, just around the corner, there is always magic in change.